This interview is for the Library of Congress Veterans uh, History Project with Kermit L. Hardin, Jr. of Urbana, who was in the U.S. Army from March 20, 1943 to December 15, 1945. Mr. Hardin served in Europe with Company K of the 301st Infantry, 94th Division as a private first class. My name is Harriet Williamson. Henry Radcliffe is the Director of Sound, Lighting, and Videography. Also in the studio is Harriet Ann Steinralph Harden and Andrew Harden. We are in the television studio of WILL in Urbana, Illinois on the University of Illinois campus. Today is Friday, October 27, 2007, which is also Mr. Harden's birthday. Uh, speaking of your birthday, would you like to talk about your family, your background, and your education, Mr. Harden? I have a uh, uh, family of, uh, of course, my mother and father, and uh, two, I had two brothers and two sisters. One brother died uh, when he was only five years old, uh, and we lived on a farm, and uh, I, I grew up on a farm. and. Uh, where were you born? Born in McQuan, Illinois. Okay, where is Knox that? Knox County. Uh -huh. In uh, uh, the, uh, I was the first. I was the oldest of the, the. My father was rather unique. He had five children before he was sixteen year, or before he was twenty-one years old. Oh my goodness! <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so. But uh, we, were, we were a farm family. My father then later became an engineer for a mining company. Uh, and, uh, but we still farmed. He, he did both jobs. Mm -hmm. So I graduated in high school and came to the University of Illinois. Spent three semesters here until uh, uh, I, I enlisted. I was here during, well, when Pearl Harbor happened. Mm -hmm. Of course, everyone dashed out and enlisted <laughs> the next week or so, uh, and I was just just old enough to enlist, and uh, enlisted in December, and was called into service in March of 1943. How did you choose to be in the army? Oh, I don't. I I guess <laughs> it just seemed like everybody else was going to the army. It was. It was. Mm -hmm. Did you enlist with some friends? Oh yeah, a lot, mm -hmm. lots of friends here on the. Campus. And did they stay with you during your your experience in the military? None, not a single one mm -hmm. uh, with, with me. But in my experience, I ran into an awful lot of uh, college mm -hmm. age uh, men. Now, what were you studying when you came to the University of Illinois before you enlisted in the army? I was going to be a math or history teacher. Uh -huh. And. Uh, and had you been following the news of the world at that point in time, and did you think do you think you had an understanding of what was happening? Oh, I don't I don't remember that mm -hmm. too much. <laughs> I, I remember that everyone was sort of surprised with the attack at Pearl Harbor, and that mm -hmm. sort of brought everything into focus at that particular time. Uh, of course, the draft was in force, but I wasn't old enough to be drafted, so I didn't. Uh, worry too much about that. Mm -hmm. So how old were you then when you did enlist? I came to the university when I was 16 years old. Mm -hmm. And uh, so and then So you were 17 then when you enlisted? Actually, I just I I was I'm born in October, so I was mm -hmm. 16 for the first 2 months of my first year here. Mm -hmm. Then 17 and then uh, I was uh, just two months older than 18 when I enlisted. So you were extremely young when you joined the military. Well, I, I was uh, young in age, but mm -hmm. uh, I wasn't unique mm -hmm. because there were a lot of people same age I was and so mm -hmm. forth. Now, where mm -hmm. did you start your boot camp training? I went to Camp Robinson in Arkansas for uh, basic training, and I was there only three weeks uh, when I was pulled out of there and uh, sent to Carnegie Institute, well, it was Car Carnegie Technology in Pittsburgh, to study to be an engineer. So I, I attended college, really, mm -hmm. there in an engineering curriculum for uh, three semesters. Mm -hmm. Now, how did, how did that come about? How did they take you and say, you know, you should go into engineering training? Well, when you went into the service, you took, uh, well, 
place, a sort of a placement type test. Mm -hmm. And a result of that, uh, I guess they thought that I could be a good engineer and, mm -hmm. and uh, ask if I wanted to do it, go to school, and I, of course, did. Now, what kinds of things did you learn at Carnegie? It was a regular college curriculum in engineering, just mm -hmm. the regular math, the engineering courses, mm -hmm. and very, very, just like a regular student there. Now, when you were there, did, did you know that you were going to eventually be taken back and sent back into uh, maybe a theater of war? Well, what the, the prognosis of this was that we'd become an officer. In the in the army, mm -hmm. and go into uh, go into active duty, mm -hmm. <clears throat> but this was to be after you had completed your engineering training. Mm -hmm. uh, what happened was they they curtailed the program before uh, we finished up. Did so, they curtail the program because they needed infantry? Is... Well, they they didn't really need a lot of engineers. I think was mm -hmm. the main thing, and and of course uh, they were getting ready for the invasion of Europe, mm -hmm. and. Uh, they were building up the armed forces and so mm -hmm. forth. So when I left there, I went back to the infantry. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, it, I, it was very unique for a lot of my friends because I never took basic training. Oh. <laughs> Only those three weeks. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> uh, but that, again, was there were a lot of us in that situation mm -hmm. that uh, were there. But uh, So when you left Carnegie, then where did you go next? I went to uh, Camp McCain, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And what what happened there? What was well? The idea it, it was there? it was a, a uh, uh, an advanced infantry training division, mm -hmm. uh, and you were getting ready to go to Europe or go to war somewhere. Now, we didn't did, know. did you know that you were going to Europe? No, okay. didn't know you were going to Europe until mm -hmm. they actually assigned the division. Now, what kind of training for advanced infantry? What what was involved in that? Oh, you had to, marksmanship and uh, patrol work and just mock battles. Mm -hmm. It was very realistic type of mm -hmm. training. Okay, so you are there and then what is your next, what happened next? Next. And how long were you there by the way? Well, we, I went there in March of 43 mm -hmm. and was there till uh, I can't remember it. Uh, August of '43, mm -hmm. uh, when we were assigned to go to Europe. Okay, so then you were sent by train to train the East to. Coast? Uh, I can't even remember the camp in New York, staging area. Mm -hmm. we were there two days while we'd get ready to get on the boat, and, and again I had a very rather unique experience. One of the few that got to go across the ocean on the Queen Elizabeth, which was the largest mm -hmm. ship afloat at that time. And uh, of course, we went underscored because we could outrun everything that was in the ocean, but didn't seem to worry any. It was 18,000 of us on the ship. That's uh, remarkable. What was it like being on that ship? What, what was the da daily life like, and how long did uh, the crossing take? It took five, uh, oh, about five and a half days, mm -hmm. and uh, you uh, ate in shifts. The kitchen operated 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Uh, you slept whenever you could. Uh, half the time you had a, a bunk in the hold of the ship, and the other half you just had to be out on deck and sleeping because mm -hmm. of the space and everything. Mm -hmm. But it was nice weather, warm. It was it was no problem. What so, was the mood on the ship? Oh, I think it was happy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a lot of poker games. <laughs> lot, lot. <laughs> so the destination then was uh, England. Yeah, it, it was uh, the uh, Scotland, really. We went to uh, Edinburgh mm -hmm. uh, and docked. The ship docked there in, a, in the Firth of Clyde. Mm -hmm. uh, it, of course, <coughs> the water wasn't deep enough for it to get to uh, the shore, so we had to go in with, climb down rope ladders off the boat and, and get into little dinghies and ride ashore. Okay, so you're in Edinburgh now, and then where did got you go? Got a train to? and went to a town called Chippingham, which is down in, uh, I guess you'd call it South Central England, and we were there for uh, four weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, again, 
some training, mainly just a staging area and, mm -hmm. until we could uh, go. Now this was August and D-Day had been the previous June. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, we knew we were going to go to France, mm -hmm. but just didn't know when. So, uh, were you able uh, to communicate with people back home all during your training and going into England? Oh yeah, well, mm -hmm. you wrote letters and stuff, which, mm -hmm. which you know, took two or three weeks sometimes to get back and forth. There mm -hmm. wasn't uh, any airmail or anything like that. So, had you developed friendships at this point in time with people that you were with? Oh, you become very close to the people in your company because mm -hmm. you learn to depend on each other and so forth. So, so yeah. when when did orders come down then to go to Europe? Uh, I don't remember the exact date. It was. Uh, first or second week of September, mm -hmm. we went across the channel. And uh, that that was no problem either. Uh, we went across the channel. The only problem was we had to wait ashore because there wasn't any uh, docks. We, we landed at what was Omaha Beach. Mm -hmm. But by that time, the beach had been cleared and we were, there wasn't anybody shooting at us when we got out there, mm -hmm. you know, so. When then did you get into actual combat. So you're, you're in France and... We moved from the beach area uh, down to the town of, outside the town of Lorient. Mm -hmm. And part of our division was there. I was around Lorient. The other part of it went to St. Nazaire. Those are two ports there on the western edge of uh, France. What was the strategy for your particular... Well, you, knew about the war that was they had the our armed forces had broken out of the deadlock if you want to call it at the beach uh, I think the original theory was that we'd get off that beach in about two weeks or so but it took three or four mm -hmm. and uh, no, this town of little town of San Lo uh, the tanks broke out of there one day and just uh, ran as fast as they could across France and they cut off uh, Sixty-five thousand dollar German, sixty-five thousand Germans, in the town of Lorient and Saint Nazaire, and uh, they, they were completely cut off from getting to uh, back home. And uh, so we, our first assignment was to keep them there. Mm -hmm. And they stayed there until three days after the end of the war, so they were there for a long time. So were they? Did they then become prisoners of war, or was that just continuing? No, no, fighting? they were. They were. They were. Uh, uh, very active. Uh, we, we would run patrols in there occasionally to see if they were trying to do anything. There was always a, the thought that they might try and break out of there. Mm -hmm. uh, well, 65,000 men, that's quite a... Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And they were having trouble supplying them because there was blockade and that was Atlantic Ocean on the other side and they blockaded that. So they were mainly uh, supplied by submarines. Mm -hmm. And Lorient, there was tremendous submarine pins there which are still there today, in fact. So that's uh, a part of the strategy was to destroy just, those submarine bases? Oh, they, they, they couldn't. Mm -hmm. Bomb could make a direct hit. They had 18-foot concrete top on them, so mm. a bomb didn't, didn't mm -hmm. do anything to them. Oh, you can go there today, and they look like they were, other than the, 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 just the oldness of it, you thought they were built 10 years ago. Now, did have you been back? Have, oh, yes. How many times have you been back to Europe? I've been to uh, Europe f uh, four times. Mm -hmm. And have you visited the various sites where you fought? Oh, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, about three years ago, we had a, uh, we were invited back by uh, the, the town where we were captured. And I was captured in the Lorient section. That's mm -hmm. where I became prisoner. And uh, so we went back and They've got a museum there. Uh, well, with a lot of the material that I brought with me here mm -hmm. that's on display there. And uh, in fact, we've been invited to go back again this June uh, for a celebration of mm -hmm. some sort. So do you, you attend the reunions then? And oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Not every one of them, but I've been to a lot of them. They're now, getting smaller and smaller, you know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So you... You were in combat for how many days then before you were captured? Uh, well, combat may not be the right word. 
because we're in this mm -hmm. holding, I mean, mm -hmm. uh, it was really boring. Uh, the, the only uh, activity was when you went out on patrol. And then sometimes you'd go out on patrol and wouldn't find anything, and sometimes you'd get, you'd get shot at. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you get surrounded and get chaptered like I did. <laughs> Is that what happened? You yeah. were on patrol? Right. Mm -hmm. And why don't you talk about that, How, what that experience was like? Well, it was a pretty bad day. Uh, we, we got, there were 55 of us on patrol. It was a big patrol. Uh, and uh, we got surrounded and uh, five were killed and 23 wounded from about nine o'clock in the morning till dark. Mm -hmm. And uh, our forces tried to come in and uh, re to relieve the, we were the surrounding, and, but they couldn't get through either. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, it was getting dark and mortars were coming in on us all the time. And mm -hmm. so we decided we, couldn't really, and we were running out of ammunition too. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so then you were you were captured by the Germans. Yes. And then what happened after that? Well, we went. Uh, uh, we went into the town of Lorient, and stayed at a. Well, what they called a prison. It was, it was really a. I think a, some sort of manufacturing, uh, uh, building. And they build a fence around it to make and close it. Mm -hmm. And we were there for uh, probably a week. And during that time, we were being interrogated by their intelligence people. Uh, and uh, then after that was over, they put us on a boat and took us out to the Ile de Groy, which is out in the bay, about three miles out in the Atlantic Ocean, a little island maybe five miles long and couple miles wide and there was a big uh, fort there and that was a, our prison camp. Were there other people who had also been in prison there besides they, the Well, not from your there had been some uh, it was relatively new uh, because uh, they'd only been surrounded there for 3 weeks so they didn't they they had British and uh, the uh, uh, and a few uh, they had some Frenchmen and, and us. There were uh, 146 or 49 Americans uh, captured. Uh, some of those were severely wounded and were taken to a hospital in Lorient and spent the whole time in, uh, in the hospital. Mm -hmm. uh, I was not hurt at all. Uh, and uh, the, the big problem was that we didn't have, get anything to eat. Mm. In that 45 days, I lost 40 pounds. So you had Well, you got some, what they called coffee in the morning, which was barley water heated up, I think, mm -hmm. or something, mm -hmm. and some black bread. And uh, Once in a while, the, the French, who were still living there, of course, would smuggle in apples or uh, things like that for us. But uh, we didn't have very much. And then, of course, we, we stole like mad. Uh, we were in this in this fort. It had a moat and everything else, and uh, they, we were confined. And so they would. We had finally asked if we could go for walks or just get out of there or something. Mm -hmm. And so they started letting us do that. There'd be a couple of guards at the head of the column and a couple of guards at the back. Uh, they weren't too worried about us going anywhere because <laughs> we'd had to swim three miles or so. And uh, so we would walk through this little island and, and come to some poor farmer's garden. <laughs> it wouldn't take long to clean out a row of radishes or, uh, or sugar beets or anything else growing there. Was there and, a currency in the camp, like cigarettes or...? No, no cigarettes mm -hmm. or anything. So. There was so a, escape was impossible, and well, <laughs> I, I, we, you know, one of the things they tell you if you're ever captured, you're supposed to always consider how to escape. Mm -hmm. Although it didn't take us long to consider that that wasn't <laughs> too good an idea there, uh, and uh, so. Uh, were you did you segregate yourselves into nationalities, or was everybody? Well, they were. We were segregated. Mm -hmm. We. 
we were all Americans where I was mm -hmm. in, in this particular time. Did any leaders come to the fore and, and uh, do things like try and organize activities or? Oh, we played a lot of bridge. We made cards <laughs> out of cardboard and played bridge. <laughs> and uh, uh, we learned to steal, I guess, would be the big thing we could. Mm -hmm. So uh, they, they, once in a while they'd need people to haul food from the dock up to the fort and they'd have us do that and, and I, I remember one time three of us stole a whole bag, I mean about a 50 pound bag of carrots <laughs> by just sticking them down in our pants and everywhere else. To, <laughs> so. Where, while you were there, did you receive any communication from the outside world in terms of either letters from home or uh, news for, of what was going on in terms of the war? No. Well, of course, the, we were declared missing in action mm -hmm. to our family, mm -hmm. so they didn't know whether we were alive or not. Uh, my mother did write three letters, uh, and uh, I, never, I didn't receive them until Christmas when we were exchanged. She sent them through the Red Cross. Mm -hmm. And the, the Red Cross, uh, uh, had, the Red Cross was very helpful because they was a source of inf of communication. So they uh, would they visit did. the camps? Represent well, no, they wouldn't uh, visit. But they, they were, there was a red, uh, I don't know, the, the documentary that all for one English officer that mm -hmm. WIL has shown uh, before, uh, sort of identifies the, uh, the, uh, the English officer was, all, uh, he was trying to escape. All in fact, he did escape. He, he was not on the island. He was on the mainland. And he did escape a couple of times and got captured and brought back. And, so he swam? No, he, he did not swim. He was still on the mainland. He wasn't assigned. He, the British were not out on the island where we were. Okay. So. Now, was there communication with the guards then? Did they talk oh, with yes, you? Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So they were humane. It was. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In fact, uh, I learned to play chess from a German guard. Mm -hmm. He had a chess set. And, and the guards were pretty bored, too. They were, they were usually older mm -hmm. the, uh, men that were probably too old for combat. And... and uh, I don't think it was a big job to keep us there. <laughs> <laughs> so then how did you get released? Because you had mentioned that you were there for 45 days. So. Well, there, there was a Red Cross man by the name of Jeroe Hodges with our division. And some the, French, the main communication was with French. The French could run between both lines. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they, they apparently got word that we were in there and we were starving. And so he one day just got in his Jeep with a white flag and drove right into the German lines and said he was a Red Cross person and he wanted to visit us. And uh, they said no. And then he said, well, he, would, he wanted to send in some food and uh, clothes. We, it was getting winter uh, and we had, of course the day we were captured was probably 80 degrees, mm -hmm. uh, and we didn't have really warm clothes, and uh, there was no heat where we lived. And we eventually got a little pot belly stove that we uh, uh, could heat up and warm us up a little. But, uh, uh, and he came in and, and he arranged. Uh, we did finally get some cigarettes and old Henry bars uh, through him that the Germans he he brought to the Germans and mm -hmm. and uh, he got a receipt from them that they were going to deliver him and everything else. And of course, <laughs> he never knew whether until later whether they were ever delivered or not. But they were. Mm -hmm. And I didn't smoke, but the the fellows that did smoke were really having a hard time because there were oh no cigarettes there mm -hmm. and they rolled up grass and paper and try and smoke that and it was. So when they got the cigarettes, that was probably much more. And the old Henry bars made us all sick because we we hadn't eaten solid food for a long time. And mm -hmm. So, but uh, well, lose forty pounds in forty-five days is. <laughs>
And there were some men that were bigger than I was that lost more pounds than that, too. Mm -hmm. So, so how, tell me, uh, uh, your release then was when? Well, we got really, he, he arranged this exchange. Mm -hmm. It was supposed to be uh, uh, rank for rank, an a able-bodied German for uh, all of us, even those that, of us who were wounded and so forth. Mm -hmm. They wanted able-bodied Germans and uh, for rank for rank. And uh, so they had a day when they just called a truce, 9 o'clock in the morning till 5 o'clock at night. Uh, and they arranged for this little exchange in the little town of Etel. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we, they loaded us up that morning. We, we found out about about uh, a day before we left the camp to go do this. And uh, they, they told us that in the morning now we're going to take you to be exchanged. And uh, we had a lovely breakfast that morning. <laughs> they, they fed us well that day. That was the only time we ever had really anything to eat. And we went to this place, and the German officers and all uh, uh, met the American officers. They went in a little cafe, had some wine and coffee, and worked out the deal. And, and uh, everything was going well until some of the Germans, who they brought to be exchanged, refused to be exchanged. <gasps> well, when you think about it, they were going into a place where they all they were going to do, they were going to have a scarcity of food because mm -hmm. the Germans, had, well, they had a lot more food than we did, but mm -hmm. they, it was still pretty scarce. And there was, they probably weren't going to do much fighting other than picking our patrols and so forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they refused to go. So later in the day, why the, the Americans had to give up a few more Germans for, uh, they, I, I don't know this for a fact, but mm -hmm. the, I was told that they, Gave seven Germans for me, because uh, <laughs> I was late in the day and he made an exchange. When, oh my when you begin so to worry, it was one at a time. Yeah, when people were being exchanged. Yeah, there was there was a certain procedure. You know, mm -hmm. you had to be sure you got the right rank and zero oh, number that and, very and, and and all that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And then the the German doctors uh, always give a physical to the German that what they want to accept because they want to be sure is able bodied, oh. and. Uh, so, so it's a very time-consuming process. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And they took care of the seriously wounded first, our wounded. Mm -hmm. And it's, some of those were still on stretchers and so mm -hmm. forth, which took a, well, it took a longer time just to get them there and mm -hmm. uh, because they had to have come by ambulance and things of that sort. So. so the truce ended, the prisoners were exchanged, and then what happened to you next? Well, well I went back and uh, there was a, of course, the first thing we did, we got de-loused because mm -hmm. <laughs> there were things crawling on. We only had one set of clothes, you know, mm -hmm. for 45 days. And uh, then we uh, uh, started eating, which was more of a trauma than you can imagine because almost everything made you uh, sick mm. because you had to eat anything. I, and the, I remember the kitchen ask each one of us what we, we wanted to eat. Some of us thought we'd have pancakes and syrup. <laughs> that really made us sick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it took us a few days to do that. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, and then we had a physical. And if we were in good shape, which I turned out to be, uh, we were reassigned back to a unit. And you could go back to the unit you were in before. So that's, mm -hmm. that's what I did. So how, how long then did you take to recuperate before you were sent back to your unit? It was about five days. Mm -hmm. So that's a very short period. Got back in so time got time back in time to go on a patrol and capture <laughs> one of the old guards. <laughs> <laughs> now you had said that you really hadn't gone through boot camp, essentially. So what kind of combat training did you have or did you not have any we really didn't have any other than uh, the the non-commissioned officers. Mm -hmm. I was not alone in this. There was lots of others that had mm -hmm. been in the same boat. Uh, so they'd hold little training sessions off by the side somewhere. Uh, I had never knew nothing about a rifle. So you had no more, no rifle training. No. 
Oh and my goodness. Uh, so you had to learn how to disassemble it and clean mm -hmm. it. And, what was uh, your rifle? Was it a? It was an M1. M1. Mm -hmm. So you were learning to shoot while you were in combat, essentially. Well, it was, no, the, see, this happened, my training was still in the United States oh, after, okay. I, after I left AP. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. No, no one ever shot at me while we were in training. But we were well trained by the time we got to New York to mm -hmm. go to Europe. Mm -hmm. so, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, so. um, okay, it's five days after you've returned, and what, where are we located? We're still in We're still, France. Still around Laureate. Okay. So, so. And how long did your unit or your company then, or regiment, I should say, stay in that area? We left there in uh, the last part of December which was after the Battle of the Bulge started. Mm -hmm. We rode for trucks for about three days and went directly into front lines in the Battle of the Bulge. Mm -hmm. Do you, Would you like to talk about that? Well, the, that, that was a little, certainly a different type of war than we'd been out on patrol and so mm -hmm. forth. But the main thing was it, it was extremely cold. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, so you always had to fight the cold, uh, and uh, the uh, we were happened to be on the what they call the southern end of the of the bulge, uh, and uh, we had a lot of hard fighting in small German towns in the Saar and near the mm -hmm. Saar River and and in there and so forth, and of course that was the time when uh, it was so cold that. Sometimes you couldn't get back to get warm because you stick your head out of a foxhole or something to get shot, uh, and a lot of people uh, froze. That's mm -hmm. where they fro frozen frozen feet and so forth. And at the end of January, the last week in January, uh, I went back to, to well for a little rest in the one of the towns and found out that I was frozen from the waist down. Uh, took off my boots and my feet swelled up in a hurry and split open. And so I went to the hospital for 30 days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what kind of treatment do they give you for that? I laid in the bed, uh, flat on my back, uh, with no covers from that covered my legs. Uh, they were exposed to the air at all times. And every so often the doctor would come in and Look around, they stick pins in your feet when they first started and didn't feel anything. Mm. And uh, they had to restore the circulation. Mm -hmm. and if they didn't, they took off your leg. Mm -hmm. So, Have you had any residual health problems as a result of that? Experience? Well, I, I'm right now considered 100% disabled. Mm -hmm. uh, but I only got that for oh, a couple, three years ago because of some new legislation and so forth. And they went back and checked on all that stuff and mm -hmm. so forth. Uh, I found out some of the fellows that were in prison with me were, have been declared disabled several, oh, well, many, mm -hmm. 10, 15 years ago or so. But uh, Now, you were in the hospital for 30 days and did your... Um, Sir, obviously, your circulation was restored, but yep. did did everything heal, and they considered you fit then to return? To oh yeah, I went back comments? went back to my unit. Mm -hmm. in but Tampa. it was still very cold. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, the the well, when I went back, we did a lot of traveling by truck because by that time the the bulge was pretty well taken care of and the Germans were really on a on the run mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we some days we'd ride a truck all day and stop overnight somewhere and expect to have a battle the next day well there weren't any Germans there so you took off again mm -hmm. now the uh, earlier fighting before you were hospitalized yeah. was that a kind of house to house kind of combat oh well yes in this one little town called Ninning uh we took that we took the town from the Germans and they came back and took it back from us and we took it from them again they came back and took it so mm -hmm. we traded that off 
that was pretty gory there. Mm -hmm. uh, we usually were able to remove our dead, but the Germans weren't. They just lay in the streets mm -hmm. so, for three or four days there. Do you feel that um, the officers who were in, in charge were fair in terms of the way they handled um, the soldiers and things were equal in the way you went out? Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, they, <laughs> they were very equal because you were getting uh, replacements daily, mm -hmm. uh, either from wounds or from, uh, from frostbite. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, we we left we left Ninning when Ninning we finally held on to it. Uh, the day that we took off from Ninning, our company, which would have been uh, fifty or sixty men, uh, to go across a little valley up and try and take a hill on the other side, which we did. But there was only thirteen of us that made it to the hill. Mm. Uh, and then uh, the next day. Of course, they were all replaced with people. Some never even been in combat before. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I remember you asked, mentioned an officer. There was a, a second lieutenant that was assigned to us who was scared to death because he, he just got out of office training school. Mm -hmm. And we had these dugouts in the, well, hillsides that we could jump in if we heard a shell coming or something. And, he jumped into one of those, and it warmed up a little that day, and it fell in on him. <laughs> None of the rest of us even jumped because, well, you become accustomed. You, when you hear the whine of the shell, you know where it's going to go, and you sort of disregard it. It's the ones that you don't hear, the dangerous ones. But well, what, it, what was it like for you all then to be losing people and then having replacements coming in, and some of these people were this was their first combat, would you kind of take them under your wing, or what? how did all of that work? Well, you had to, I, I don't recall it, whether you say you took them under your wing or not, but mm -hmm. you, you certainly warned them about things that you do. Uh, they were very disbelieving of the fact that when you'd hear a shell that you shouldn't jump somewhere to get out of the way. Mm -hmm. but we, we wouldn't pay attention to that, but, uh, but uh, so, but there was uh, uh, lots of replacements. How would you evaluate the Germans that you were fighting against? What do you think? How do you think they stacked up in terms of their equipment or their strategy or their? Um, well, the the Germans in the Battle of the Bulge were crack troops. I mean, they were really uh, the, the panzers, the tank, the tank men, and everything mm -hmm. else uh, were usually pretty extreme. But a lot of the after you, you get by that level, that a lot of the uh, uh, replacements were either very young or very old, and uh, they they had a pretty li hard life. Now, besides the contact you had when you were in the prisoner of war camp for 45 days, did you continue to uh, have contact with uh, German soldiers as you proceeded through well, you'd your ca combat? You'd capture. Mm -hmm. But you, if you, ca you had very small contact with them. Mm -hmm. uh, mainly you wanted to be sure they didn't have any guns or anything on them. Mm -hmm. And then you'd send them back to the back of the line somewhere and someone else took care of them. Mm -hmm. So uh, you, did, you didn't do that. But, uh, so after the Battle of the Bulge and your proceed, where are you heading when you're on these trucks and f following the movement of the Germans who are reaching? We went to, uh, uh, our, our company went to Lubitschaffen, which is on the Rhine River. Uh, and we thought we was going to have to fight to get across that river time we got there, the Germans were pretty well uh, uh, running. And, uh, and then uh, we had troops in the Saar Valley, which were the, where the industrial part of Germany was at that time, that were fighting. We were south of that, sort of uh, just 
bottling up the Germans so that uh, I didn't have any serious battles until after we'd crossed the Rhine River uh, in the in the in the Saar Valley there, uh, which would have been um, oh uh, middle of March or late March or something, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, Germans weren't too avid uh, fighters at that time. Mm -hmm. The Russians were coming to Berlin, getting to close to Berlin, and so. Were would, you were you aware of that that the Germans were also coming? You know, as a soldier, d did you have news of that? The uh, oh, uh, well, yeah, you you got that through capturing Germans, and mm -hmm. they tell you, you know, that they're they're done fighting; they didn't want to fight anymore, and so forth. But. Uh, I mean, they didn't tell me that, but that's the information we got from. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you would like to say about that particular battle that you had just mentioned in the Saar Valley? What did, what was that battle called? It was just the the Rhineland was the uh, Rhineland. Okay. Uh, one of the. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, well, it was. Uh, it was a lot. It was fighting in woods, and. Uh, uh, as long as you had a tank around, it helped. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, uh, that sounds very tricky, fighting in the woods. Yeah, but, but uh, well, first of all, you, uh, they can be hiding in there, mm -hmm. and the other is, of course, the trees are cut down, line of sight, and everything like that. But. Uh, uh, how, how do the tanks proceed through the woods? Do they? Well, do you have to have people like engineers chopping down trees? No, or? they just run. If they did, if they couldn't run over them, they they wouldn't mm -hmm. do that. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, then of course you had the air force that was bombing too. Uh, sometimes they got a little close to <laughs> to you, <laughs> but mm -hmm. uh, that would never happen very often. Now, after the Rhineland um, expedition, what was what happened to you in terms of your next experience? Well, about the, uh, let's see, the war ended in May, so it was uh, that was near the end of the war, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, I was in. Well, I guess the, when the war ended, uh, I was in. Uh, in the Rhineland area, and uh, we became military police, really, mm -hmm. getting the civilians and everything lined up. But eventually I ended up in Czechoslovakia uh, meeting the Russians as they were coming from the east. Mm -hmm. And what was your job in Czechoslovakia with the Russians? Mainly keep them on the other side of the railroad track. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which was interesting because they didn't let, they didn't mind us going on over their side, but we sh sure didn't want them over on our mm -hmm. side. And so just, we, we and were trying just, to occupy territory and making sure that the Ru yeah. what Russians would not further yeah. come from yeah, come further. Right. Okay. So, uh, but uh, I, I was in Czechoslovakia when I got enough points to be discharged. Mm -hmm. so. Um. While you were in Czechoslovakia, did you have any contact with the civilian population? Oh, yeah. yeah. What were yeah. some of the stories that those people related to you about their war experiences? Well, they, the part that we were in, they were very bitter against the Germans mm -hmm. because they had come in and uh, stolen their cattle, and, uh, or not necessarily stolen it, but at least mm -hmm. maybe butchered it and ate it or something. But uh, they, were, they were pretty bitter about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, uh, but uh, we really didn't have a, a lot of, uh, we, uh, we ended up being stationed in this, just a small village. Uh, with our company was sort of in charge of that village. Mm -hmm. And uh, they went, they started, it was spring, and they were starting their planning and they were trying to get their lives back to normal again. So you were the government for the village? No, no, no not really. Uh, they, they had their own government. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things, there was a, 
this was always happening after the end of the war. There were people that cooperated with the Germans, uh, which now then the rest of the population didn't appreciate. And mm -hmm. That got rather nasty at times with some of the civilians fighting other civilians and mm -hmm. so forth. Are there any um, things that you would like to talk about in terms of people that are very memorable to you during this experience or uh, other events that you would like to mention? Well, the, actually, as a whole, we came, uh, we didn't have a lot of contact with the civilian population, mm -hmm. uh, except around Lorient there, mm -hmm. the, there, but you, we soon learned you couldn't trust them because they could go back and forth between the Germans and mm -hmm. so forth. And, and uh, uh, the day we were captured, uh, they uh, brought us, uh, uh, we had, I said we had five killed, and uh, the one of those pictures that you're going to see later is the, at the cemetery where we buried them, but we only buried f four, and we, one of them was missing. And what had happened was that the, uh, his body got stolen by a Frenchman, and the Frenchman put him in a wheelbarrow and flew him back to our lines. But when he got there, he, he didn't have any clothes or anything. Mm. The Frenchman had taken all that. But mm -hmm. so, uh, Are there any people in the Army who were friends of yours that you would like to mention or talk about, or any officers? Well, we had uh, the, uh, of course, my best friends were those that were captured with me. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of them, after they were released, that was the end of the war for them mm -hmm. because of various things, uh, but uh, there were 12 of us that got together for this documentary mm -hmm. uh, that I hadn't, well, some of them I hadn't heard of, of since we were exchanged, uh, and some of them I'd been in contact with. Uh, I think I was the only one that went, went clear through the war without uh, uh, being disconnected from our outfit. Mm -hmm. Beside your frostbite, did you suffer any other wounds during the... Well, I got blown up by a mine. <laughs> it was a, on one of these patrols in Lorient. Uh, uh, this was a hedgerow company, country, mm -hmm. and there was a little gap in the hedgerow, and you always were suspicious that this was at night, and... Uh, uh, we always look for trip wires and things and those, and sure enough, here was this opening with a trip wire. And <laughs> only problem was that the darn cat <laughs> was around there, and somebody scared the cat, and he ran through the trip wire and blew it up. It turned out to be just a little one of those little pop grenades that. Uh, I, I was in the hospital for three days. Well, was didn't even go to a regular hospital, just an aid station for mm -hmm. three days. I had a piece of shrapnel on my cheek and and uh, blown up, blew blew the gun out of my hands and so forth. But, oh, uh, but <laughs> there were another fellow was with me there. It was the same thing. But, mm -hmm. So, is there anything else you would like to talk about in terms of uh, your? war experiences in Europe that we haven't touched on? Yeah. Well, I, I received some medals and so forth. Uh -huh. I don't know. I got the Silver Star and the Bronze Star and a Purple Heart for my cat adventure. And I believe that they're with us today and we'll take a look at those when we finish yeah. the interview. So you received enough points to go back home and that was in December yeah. of 1945. How did you get back home? Well, I took uh, many truck rides from Czechoslovakia to La Havre, got on a boat and went to New York and, and came home for uh, 30 days. Uh, and during uh, that, during the, when I was home, I found out I'd won the Silver Star, which gave me enough points that I could be discharged. So when I went back to Fort Sheridan to, at the end of my leave, I was discharged. Mm -hmm. were, so. you, <clears throat> were you in 
co contact with your family then after you, excuse me, <coughs> after um, you were out of the prisoner of war? Oh, yeah. They, yeah. they came to realize that you were oh, missing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They found out, uh, well, three or four days after because they were notified. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the first communication that they got was from me was in the middle of December. Uh, when, after you were discharged, uh, what did, what happened to you after that? I came here at the university. So you went back to school? In January, the semester started and I entered school. Uh -huh. And what was it like to be back in school <clears throat> after being through this experience of war? Well, I guess, <laughs> first of all, I, I was very unique because I was one of the first veterans to come back. Mm -hmm. uh, and the V-12 boys were here. In fact, I had one for a roommate. Could you tell me what the V-12 was? The V-12 was, was a, a Navy uh, officer training thing, which the university had at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, uh, I, I roomed, roomed with him for a while. Then uh, they set up some sort of a preference for housing to live in the dorms. Uh, well, I, I lived in the, in the dorm, but uh, and there were only three dorms for men that time. That's the three across from Huff Jim. Uh, and uh, so I got in there and uh, was, I was, had a second semester junior standing, which was the old man of the <laughs> group. <laughs> How old were you? Well, let's see, I was 22 then. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So. Then when did you, uh, what were you studying when you came back? Did you continue with your history or did math. you change? Uh, well, I'd concentrate in math. Math. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. And w what year did you graduate from the University of Illinois? In 1946. And did you continue your education? Well, I, I didn't. I eventually got a master's degree from uh, Bradley, mm -hmm. and then I got a doctorate from the Illinois and uh, so in uh, 72, I guess. Mm -hmm. And when did you get married? Got married in 1959. Mm -hmm. I have two children. Did this uh, experience of being in World War II, did that affect your life? And, and if so, how, in what way? Oh. I suppose it did. I never even thought about it. The only thing I used to tell people was that when they'd get all excited about things that weren't going to right, I'd say, well, forget it. It'll get better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, but uh, I don't know that. I don't know what my life was going to be before. <laughs> I didn't have enough of it to know before I went in. Mr. Harden, would you like to say anything else before we end the? Interview. I, don't, I don't think so. Okay. okay. Well, thank you very, very much. Good. Good. It's Fine. been a pleasure to talk with you. Fine. Henry, we have <clears throat> a number of things that uh, we would like to keep. <laughs> yeah, we just need it We've for been here seconds. all night trying right. to get you to be still on the camera to be okay. still. Okay. Um, you said Did you want to use your flag or uh, I think we're enough to pass out. All right. Um,
veterans that had interesting stories that I heard about, you know, from them and that have died in the last probably six years or so. Um, and Ken Bernstein, when he said one of the things that got him going was the fact that even all on. I was going to say, is, is there a time when they're all on? Uh, sometimes. Um, during fun drives, they're off and on. It's just sometimes it's helpful for genealogical purposes. Oh. So I usually carry it in and I've forgotten to ink the evening.